Yeah. All right, so I wanted to do this, Keith, just so you know. I wanted to get guys together who have gone through the, the process or know someone or help in, in the industry because I think there needs to be some education um, and some expanded education from our perspective. For sure. Not necessarily sure. from a medical perspective, but from the survivor perspective. Absolutely. What, what do you call yourself today when somebody says um, you had prostate cancer? Do you consider yourself still a prostate cancer survivor, a victim, a fighter? What are you? Well, sure, a survivor. Survivor. Uh, yeah, I went, went through it, uh, had the surgery, went through all the emotional ups and downs associated with that, um, and survived that and feel stronger and bigger, better for it. So you like the word survivor, because yeah. it is. It's a survival totally. every day. Absolutely. Um, do you like the word, because this is very sensitive, uh, when people say you're cured of cancer. I don't know if I like that word. I've never used it. Yeah. Even though the detection says you don't have the cancer in your body, you're almost afraid to go with the big C word, the cure right. word, like aren't it's you? It's all gone. You know what um, I'm saying? I don't, I don't think about it much. Okay. I, I figure that I, I had it. I did to the best of my abilities. I accepted the right uh, process, the right treatment. Um, and I, I kind of, I'm, I'm at peace with that right now. All right. You have some unique aspects about. Uh, your battle and uh, what you did and do uh, to help with prostate cancer awareness. Let's just get all the specifics out of the way. So, Keith, um, how old are you today? 52. All right. So, wow, I'm younger than you are. Yeah. I, I thought I was an old man. You don't look 52, <laughs> dude. Seriously. I, taking good care of yourself. I, I think cancer did you some good. Yeah. <laughs> so how old were you when you were diagnosed? 44. 44 years of age, living and working where? Here in Colorado. And, and how were you diagnosed? How did this all come down? That, that's actually quite a long story, yeah. so I don't, I'll try to condense it. But give or take age 40, I... It's a I, podcast, by the way. We can do uh, whatever the hell we uh, want here. Okay. I did not feel right. Yeah. I felt like something was wrong with my body. At age 40? At age 40. Are, so... Wh how conditioned were you with your body? Were you an athlete? Are, are you... I've always... Very active? Outside? Very okay. active. All right. Colorado lifestyle. Sure. I've always been athletic. I've always, you know... Okay. Mountain bike, skied. Mm -hmm. Like most of us who live here. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a pain in my left hip that started that was kind of chronic. It, it's, it was there on a very consistent basis, day in and day out. And uh, people noticed, like even here, I'd be like rubbing my left hip. It was very habitual, like doing that. God, that's so funny. It, I, I, it was, I had the same thing. No way. That's so funny you so say exactly that. Exactly what Just I like had. little pains, lower yeah. back, hip, some, little pains in that area. Like, and I thought it was just the product of playing basketball too much. I or, thought it was racquetball. I was like, oh. Too much it, did, did it go away? Never. So well, it was chronic. Until after. <laughs> okay, so you're having this pain. Any other symptoms? Yeah, so ED started showing up. Okay. Um, and then also trouble urinating. Like what kind of trouble? Let's get specific here. I just, you stand in front of the urinal and it's like nothing really is happening. And you felt the urge. Oh, totally. Like and I nothing's to coming come, out. Had to like really work at it to make that happen. Interesting. God, yeah, we come from different schools here. I had zero symptoms. Okay. But when it came to that, no urinary symptoms. Yep. I didn't have any ED symptoms. None. Yes. Zero. How about family history? Uh, grandfather passed away at 96 years old yeah. with prostate yeah. cancer. He, but he, that, that doesn't that even count. Nothing. And that's what I'm trying to get to. Dad, to, no. Yeah. I mean, there, there are two different types of prostate <laughs> cancers. There, there's the prostate cancer we have right. and, and those that are in their 80s and 90s, correct? Yep. I mean, you want to get to your 80s and 90s with prostate cancer. Totally. That's the beauty of it. Right. All right. So I'm sorry to interrupt. So you're you're feeling these, these, these chronic conditions. Your hip is bothering you. You can't urinate. At any point, did it register that you might have a prostate problem? Not prostate problem because I, I had started because I even at age 40, I was very in tune with my body. And I'm like, something's not right. So I started going to doctors. And for the pain in the hip, they gave me a drug. For ED, they gave me a drug and said, you're fine. No, 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 and no one ever, ever bothered to check your PSA? No. It took seven doctors. So did you bring up PSA or prostate? No, because you didn't know. You didn't. I didn't know to bring. I mean, it up. you're you're 40, 41, 42 years old right. at the time, so they're not even thinking PSA at that point, not correct? So when you went to go get your physicals, did you do an annual physical? Yeah. Okay, so you did blood tests. Yeah, well, I assume. 
no no one was doing PSAs on me at age. But four. blood tests didn't have the PSA value exactly. on it at that point. So you're just blind at this point, going, "What is going on?" Seven doctors. Where? Yeah. Where did you go find these doctors? All over. Like a di- I went to Boulder. I went to Kaiser. Three different doctors in Kaiser, and then one under UNC United Healthcare, and then finally, you know, fast forward after, you know, it, it was a mental challenge because mm-hmm. I had had multiple people, you know, multiple docs say nothing's wrong with me, and I knew that there was something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what. I had no idea. Well, if you're not peeing, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. So finally, um, I was through a friend of mine. Uh, recommended to go to Dr. Kevin Lutz. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know him in, here in Denver. Sure, I've heard the name. And he, I think, was a former Kaiser okay. guy that that got out of that because it was too by the book. So okay. he is kind of a just open to anything. Kind yeah. of, that he looks yeah. at not just what the protocols say based on age or whatever. He looks at everything. So I went in there January. I guess this was 2011. And you were old at that point. So that's 44. 44 at that point. Oh, I'm sorry. I was probably 43. Okay. Um, and he was the first one who said, have you ever had your PSA checked? I'm like, well, what is that? What is that? Yeah. So we got it checked. It was high. Got it checked again a couple months high later. High is in what? Do you remember was, the numbers? It was like four. Okay. And then a month or two later, it was five, 5.5. So the trend wasn't... Wow, in a month? Yeah. And so in July... I was officially diagnosed. So I had the biopsy and everything. So why'd they wait that long for the biopsy then? If the first number was four, doesn't that pretty much say, go get yourself a biopsy right away? It, it, it's They try to establish a trend a little I bit. See. Because there can be yeah. a false positive. Sure, it, sure. Just for whatever reason, you might have an elevated one. So they, they spaced it out hmm. by a couple months. Listen, man, I don't know about you, but I'm tired about hearing about these false positives. Yeah, I'd rather be wrong on one end than the other. I'd rather be wrong about being false than wrong about being positive. Correct. You know what I'm saying? If you want to tell me I don't have cancer and you've been saying you've been prodding and poking me and all these tests and all of a sudden, oh, we were wrong. Great. Yeah. But if you're wrong and I do have cancer, (laughs) one's worse than the other. Completely. When I remember reading the article in the Wall Street Journal a few years back where they changed the the protocols Mm -hmm. and said, actually, the PSA, don't even use it. There's only about 35,000 men who will not be diagnosed when, when they actually have cancer. Okay. So don't worry about those 35,000 men. I was like, what? That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's, that's a, it makes me mad, to be honest I, with you. I couldn't stand it. All right, so you're diagnosed. You did the biopsy. Yep. Um, how were you told? How'd that go down? That was pretty bad. I was not happy with that. So mm-hmm. I had the biopsy. It went past the day that the doc said he would call me. Mm-hmm. So I actually called in like a day after that. It's frustrating when you have to chase it, don't yeah. you? Yeah. So I called in, and I spoke with the nurse, and I said, so I'm just checking on mm-hmm. test results. And she's like, oh, you have cancer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, Can't thank wait. you very much. That, that's how the conversation That's went. how it went down. Yeah. Let me tell you something about our system sometimes, yeah. because there are so many of us, so many patients that I have to, I sort of have to take myself out of my body and go to that disembodied voice and say, you're just one of many and understand they don't, it's not personal. It's right. just that they're treating so many different people. Sometimes yep. they lose track of who's who and what's what. Sure. But when you have cancer, you want to be treated like you're the only one in the world with cancer because Absolutely. it's you. Right. And, and when you hear something, oh, by the way, you have cancer. Yeah. That must have just blown you away. Yeah, I remember I was sitting in my office in Boulder, and I was just like, oh, is that typically how it's delivered? Because that didn't feel good. And and after that conversation, what was next? Uh, my first call was to Katie, so my okay. eldest daughter. So she she had been... Uh, how old was she at the time? Um, so she was, say, t- 19. Now, I apologize. How many kids? What's your family situation? So there's six now. Wow. Um, first marriage, three daughters. Yeah. And with Leah, there's two boys and a girl, 17, 15, 12. Very well done. Got tech, took care of all that before the prostate was removed. Right. All right. So <laughs> you, you called Katie, and, and what happened? So she had, well, all my daughters had been kind of through the knowledge of the health stuff I'd been going yeah. through in terms of I'd been seeing multiple doctors trying to figure out what, what was going on. 
And so it was just, you know, it was a tough conversation. You know, it's sad, uncertain, the unknown, mm-hmm. scared, all those kind of things. So what were the options at that point? You're told you have cancer. You don't know what, what kind of cancer, how much cancer, uh, how, you know. I, I know when I first found out, when I was diagnosed, I was like, Take me to the operating room right now. Lay, <laughs> right. lay, lay me on the table. What, right. what do we need to do? I, I was in pure panic mode. Yeah. Did, did you? Uh, no, not not in panic mode because I I felt like I had done a heading up to uh-huh. it. I felt like I had already done some research and understood. In most cases, it's not a oh my gosh emergency room visit. Get it taken care of. Now. Sure. It's sort of a slow process. They, that's, what they, that's the thing about the prostate cancer. Oh, it's slow growing. Don't worry about it. Right. So I took my time and made, made some choices in terms mm-hmm. of where I wanted to go. I first actually had surgery planned for Florida. Again, I was trying to select doctors who had had significant experience. Wow, you're with, doing your research here, oh, brother. Yeah. And I actually I had surgery booked in Florida and like two weeks before, they called me and canceled because... Scheduling conflict? Scheduling conflict. Yeah. I love the old scheduling conflict I was like, how do you... How do you yeah. Like, I, I love that. I love it. <laughs> I love it when, you, when you're diagnosed, right, and you're sitting there going, okay, um, I'm, I'm, I've got cancer. I want this out of me. And they're going through the book. Okay, we've got this. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, how about this? No. And you're like, what do you mean no? I mean, I... You're playing roulette with my with my cancer. Oh, don't, I wish I had a recording of that conversation with the person coordinating surgeries. Yeah. The, effectively, she was like, well, and I was supposed to have surgery in the fall. I think okay. it was September. And she's like, the next available would, would be January oh. next year. And I was like, D- that doesn't feel good to me. No, how, your how, PSA's how do, how do rising. Know, how do we know the cancer won't escape? Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. She's like, oh, I think you'll be fine. I'm like, what is that? I think you'll be fine. What, why? Yeah. It, it was, All right, so what'd you do then? So I went to plan B. So I had another doc I had researched, mm-hmm. uh, as I mentioned. The earlier, robotic. Dr. Tamadon out of uh, Southern California. So I called them, scheduled it, had it done in November. Insurance cover it all? Yes. Okay, so. Well, you know, typical exactly. high deductible. But, but you're, you know. you're calling around places that carry your insurance how does that work i mean or do you find it out of network doctors does it matter uh, at that the, point the florida would have been completely out of network okay uh southern california was partially in network as okay. a kaiser affiliate sure. okay i was just curious how that works because some folks are led down certain roads because of their insurance and right. are you allowed to think independently and freely and go where you're most comfortable um sometimes not based yeah. on the dollars right yes. it, it yeah. can be very expensive um, out of network, but today, fast forward, so many more surgeons are skilled at this discipline. Yeah. yeah. So Colorado has probably many more many. doctors versus even just ten years ago. Yes. I mean, it's funny because when you had your surgery done, we talk about robotic surgery. When I heard about, it, I was like, "What? what robot?" <laughs> but back then, I mean, I couldn't even fathom uh, eight years ago. There aren't many that are doing this, so you're going to try and find somebody that's done many of them. Right. Um, did you have any other alternative plans? Was radiation, was, um, you know, wait and see, any of those options available? Or was it surgery or bust for you? Yeah, wait and see was not an option yeah. based on the Gleason score sure. and, and the amount. That and you, they, you believe it was a Gleason 7 in there somewhere? I, I want to say it was higher. Higher than, than okay. If, it was, if the eight. PSA was rising that fast, I, right. I gather it was higher. And, and they determined based on the, the 12 biopsies or what that three quarters of the prostate was cancerous. So okay. the doc's three quarters. opinion was That's like, a lot of it's, cancer it's in there. growing, you got to get it out of there. It's not an option. Wait and see is not an option. How did it not get outside the capsule? At three quarters, I mean, that's a lot of cancer. I was holding it back. I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so uh, surgery day, you go to Cali. um, What, do you spend a week there? How'd that all go down? Oh, gosh, that's that's a whole nother... Would you did you skate down there? You're you know yeah. we're gonna get into his inline skating here in a um, moment. That that was uh, an unfortunate series of events. Okay. That went down there. The, the surgery went great, and I felt really good yeah. after waking up. Surgery is not as bad as people think, right? The the yeah. prospects of getting cut four times with a knife. Yeah. It was, no. What what happened subsequent? And again, I'll condense it. Yeah. I was supposed to be there just two days. Uh-huh. I ended up because of a bad catheter. Oh, I ended up with three 
major infections. Oh, in when you, what do you mean a bad catheter? It was broken, and I was urinating inside my body. <laughs> All right, I'm going to st- <laughs> shake this off a little bit. Yeah, so that developed into a week, a, about a week-long stay in California. Then I got back to Colorado, and I, I thought everything was okay. Middle of the night, I wake up with the 105-degree fever, and then subsequent ended up uh, three weeks in the hospital in Colorado. Excuse me real quick. Adelio, here's our next guest. Can you just uh, tell Chris where to go? Thank you. Um, so the catheter was the biggest fear for me, talking to people who had the surgery. They're like, yeah. ah, the surgery's easy. It's the catheter. that you, you had one of the most <laughs> terrorizing catheter experiences sounding to me. It was it, bad. Okay. Was there any anybody liable for that, or did you did you do any further research? Did you let it go? I, I I generally let it go because, um, number one, I was cancer free. Yeah, and you were the, so. The surgery happy. was yeah. solid. There yeah. was no issues there. Um, it was just one of those wrong place, wrong time. I don't know what you want to call it, but. Yeah. Um, so three weeks. Yeah. Here, in that in here in Colorado. Which hospital here? So it was uh, the I think it's Good Sam. Yeah. Up okay. off two eighty seven. Okay. In, right. uh, in Lafayette. Wow. Well, some might argue that the, the three weeks allow, allowed you to convalesce so you didn't push yourself and do some crazy stuff, and then the healing continued. I don't right. know. Whatever. So that you go through that whole thing, and you're ready to go again. Um, how long did it take you to urinate properly? Did you do the, the kegels and all that? Sure. Um, yeah, to, to, to say properly, you know, for the first three, six months, sometimes – you don't know when you're going. Exactly. <laughs> and you're leaking a lot. You're just leaking, yeah. and you don't even know it's happening. Yeah. Right? Um, but I got probably full control within six months. Six months. Um, you know? how, how much, how active are you with the Kegels today? Eight, eight years late. Do you do them at all? or Sometimes. Okay. Yeah, yeah really. I, it's funny because <laughs> I'm two months removed, and I am yeah. not um, vigilant when it comes no. to that. I just sort of, eh, okay. You like a post-it note. Yeah, on, yeah. On and, and, and do you have any issues today, eight years? No, no, I would say no. Okay. I feel probably, uh, you know, better than I was 10 years ago because uh, I don't have the problem to urinate. That's true. You had a, a pre-existing condition that led to this diagnosis, yeah. which caused you to get the, the whole thing done. Right. And now you can pee freely, right. at least. So it's kind of nice. Um, yeah. Your first PSA score after surgery, because that reveals a lot. Uh, do you remember those anxious moments? Um. I wasn't anxious no? for whatever okay. reason. I just felt really confident, um, and it was zero or sure. unreadable. And then, and then what? So every three months after that, what did the doctor three tell you? Three months for the first three years, okay. every quarter, and then it went down to once a year. All right, so once a year you walk into that doctor's office, mm-hmm. you get your PSA reading. No anxiety at all. doesn't even phase me. Are you serious? Yeah. I envy you for that. I, I just I guess I'm really comfortable and, and confident, yeah. if you will. And I, I guess knowing that a lot of things were thrown at me like they were you, yeah. and you're through it. Yeah. If something else is thrown at me, handle it. Yeah, it's funny because you're so fearful when when you're first diagnosed and you're doing all this research, you sure. mad computer Google. <laughs> yeah, I never <laughs> knew Google. Tells you a lot yeah, of exactly. Bad things when you and you're going crazy, and then as soon as you get through the first phase and the second phase, and you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks, I was, you know, the urge to pee was tremendous. And then you get through that. Oh, that wasn't that bad. And then right. you adapt. And yeah. um, I, I tell people this, Keith, and you tell me if I am just flying the coop dumb mad here. I tell people getting cancer and our form of cancer and the fact that we, we got it, it was probably, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's one of the best things that ever happened to me because it's changed my perspective on life and how I live. Sure. Is that fair? Yeah, definitely fair. There's no doubt about it. In a way, it did two things for me. Although I didn't like the way it was delivered when I received the news, I was actually happy in a way because there was there was uncertainty and, and it started to play with my mind. Like I had been told by many people, professionals, that nothing was wrong with me. And yet I felt something was wrong with me. So now I'm, is it a mental condition, right, mm-hmm. that – 
I'm just making this stuff up yeah. and my left hip doesn't hurt and I should be able to pee whenever mm-hmm. I want all that stuff. Um, so it was, it was actually a relief in some ways, like, okay, now I know what I have. Let's go take care of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but for sure, getting diagnosed with cancer, going through cancer, absolutely, it, it wakes you up and says, let's do some stuff. It's interesting you said you, you had to be your own. Yeah. Now, no offense to any doctors watching this because you guys are saving our lives. But you have to be your own doctor. You have to make your own diagnoses at, in at some way. point. You, you, you know, we are each – we're own doctors. We, ha- we have to be. You have to be. Because if you're not diligent, then – Things go by the wayside. You can, they're only as good as what you tell them. Put and, it that and way. I, and I can't imagine where I would be if I didn't keep pushing. Yeah. Now, did I do it fast enough? Probably not. But over the course of four years, I kept every six months or so, I'd be, uh, I got to go check this out again. Yeah. So I'm so fortunate. I, I called Dr. Lutz. Yeah. I'm so glad I took that step. And he was completely out of network. I paid out of pocket. Sure. But I took that extra step, which, okay. you know, I'm, I'm so, fortunate. I'm glad I did that. You never had to face any post-surgery radiation or any of that Correct. business. You never metastasized. You never no. got to that point. All right, because, you know, those those options are still on the table for me. I, I right. don't know yet. Right. Um, you know, I'm still early in the process, and my Gleason score was so high. So those things scare me. Yes. But at the same time, I'm sort of taking that approach, just get through it. Right. Just get through it and see what happens. So you don't want it to get to that next level. And during the course of these podcasts, I'm going to talk to guys who have been on that next level, yes. who have been there. I mean, you know, I know a lot of guys, I'm sure you do too, who caught it so late that they cannot even get the prostate removed. Correct. You, you go straight to the hormone therapy and the chemotherapy, and that's a completely different beast. It so consider is. ourselves fortunate for catching it when we did. All right, so let's get to some of the things you've done to help the cause. Um, the inline skating. Yeah. Explain what this is and what you're doing with it. Okay. So uh, my friend Eric Fozzi, he was a Technica rep in, in our 20s. Okay. So Technica, and they, they do ski boots and, uh-huh. and the like. So, and he had a whole bunch of inline skates, and he, was, he did fun, crazy tricks and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he gave me a pair, and let, let's go skating. So yeah. I was like, okay. And I think one of the first times we went out, he took me down South Boulder Road into Boulder, like right on the road. Like we're cruising down. Yeah. I thought I was going to die, right? Um, so that's how I got into it. And it's actually um, it's actually a great exercise. Oh, heck, because, are you quads? Are you kidding me? Yeah, because you're not, you're not running. You're yeah. not impacting your knees and everything. Mm-hmm. It's very smooth for the most part unless you fall on cement. Which yeah, which I'm sure fun. you've done several times. <laughs> Many times. Um, so in, in my early 30s, yeah. I actually I, I wrote 100 things I want to do before I die. Yeah. And one of, my, one of my numbers in there, number 11, I think it was, was inline skate across Colorado. Wait, what? I don't know why I put that. I you just, just, just randomly came up with that said one? I want to do something big. Okay. So fast forward to now I'm sitting recovering from cancer, and I'm look, looking at the list, uh-huh. right? I'm like, when am I going to do that? Yeah. My gosh. Like that, I better get on that because I'm not getting any younger. So I was sitting there with uh, my daughters and they came up with the skate for prostate, you know, tagline. Uh And I'm like, okay, let's, let's figure this out. So I first did some research trying to figure out which nonprofit I wanted to align with this cause, if you will. And that's where PCEC, Prostate Conditions Education Council, came about got to shorten the by shorten it up I'm, i know I'm, I'm having trouble right now P- that's why i say P- i'll always C- yeah. all right thank you all right <laughs> um but that's how i aligned with them i reached out to that group and i said this is what i'm thinking um and i want to raise money for uh, awareness for prostate cancer especially with younger men yes guys in their even 20s have been diagnosed with prostate cancer so that's what i did and i started raising money saying i'm going to do this inline skate across colorado and people would donate money by the mile or just a hundred yeah. bucks or whatever it was. And so uh, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but give or take, maybe raise 15000 or so. That's pretty good. In 2012, when I inline skated across Colorado, um, and I did that from Wyoming to Oklahoma because I, it was hard to go east to west. There's just or, not the proper roads. And- actually, I tried to get Wolf Creek Pass closed yeah. for like 10 minutes or so. <laughs> 
and the state trooper. Hey, let's close the major thoroughfare here. For, they, uh, they wouldn't do that. For inline skater right. guy. <laughs> right. So many, many amazing stories along the way. Yeah. Uh, of How long my, did it take you? Uh, it took me seven days. How sore were you? No. No, you're really, fine. Not really sore. Really? You didn't... I had blisters, yeah. um, so my feet hurt a little bit, but everything else was fine. Did you have any support people with you and yeah, fellow so, skaters? Yeah, uh, so uh, um, a friend of mine, Rick Patch, mm -hmm. he actually cycled with me for okay. actually from Denver to the Oklahoma border. Wow. Yeah. Do you still skate? Yes. Still yeah, part of your, your regimen, exercise? Yep. Man, you know, I've done that. My wife and I used to do it all the time when we lived in Phoenix. We used to go to those, those like, old canals when it yeah. wasn't raining and just go crazy it's on there. That's cool. But I never wanted to wear the wristbands, the wrist thing. The wrist and I guards. learned the hard way that if that you don't you wear, wear those, wear. you will be hurting. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. What's the worst spill you've ever taken? Um, probably It was probably on day one yeah. of my inline across Colorado where I hit a a rut that I I should have seen, maybe, I don't know, and I just did a face plant on Route 85 up up, up north of Greeley, and I actually remember, like, my Gatorade went flying out, and a car ran over that, and it was... And you finished, and you kept going. That was the first day. Dude, yeah. I would have been like, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Call Wolf Creek. We're going to close her down. I'm good. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. So uh, you did this uh, how many years ago? So that was uh, 2012, and then in, in 2013, I, because at the time I was uh, employed by a company out of Texas, okay. and I, I would go down there every month for about a week. I actually did Texas in 2013, which was even that's like a, that was hard. That's like bigger than most countries. That was hard. Yeah. How did you do Texas from one end to what end? So I did from south to north based yeah. on the winds. Yeah. I, I spoke with a lot of cy cycling groups yeah. to figure out when is the best time, what's what's the wind situation, because wind is a big issue yeah. when you're trying to go distance. What's next, um, Alaska? Yeah. <laughs> Russia? Know. Yeah, why not? I mean, do, do you have any other plans? or? I don't. Uh, I, I still, of course, I, I through PCEC, mm -hmm. um, we do work like this. We, um, you know, continue to get the word out to younger men uh, about prostate cancer awareness. Um, but it, it is dangerous because there. Here I am, skate inline skating on roads, with mm -hmm. eighteen wheelers. And yeah. It's just, it's not set up to be particularly no, safe. No, yeah. there's no canal that... that like, I didn't it. see many cyclists, let yeah. alone yeah. skaters, doing the route I did. Yeah. It's just not normal. Well, good for you, though, <laughs> for doing that. Uh, last couple questions. Uh, our, our, we have a guest coming up, Chris Muser, who is uh, going to talk about the wellness and nutrition aspect of this whole thing. He's also a fellow survivor. H had you or do you do anything differently diet-wise from pre-diagnosis to post yeah, I'd say a, a little bit heavier on the uh, vegetarian side. Okay. I still eat meat, of yeah. course, but I do do much more fruits and veggies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, although I have a sweet tooth, I, I do try to avoid sugar. I think mm -hmm. sugar is a, a, just generally a tough thing for your body. Dude, I haven't had sugar since the day I was diagnosed. Yeah. I tell my brothers that because we're sugar fanatics in our family, yeah. Italian family. I haven't had a cookie. I haven't had a piece of cake. I haven't had a That's pop. impressive. I haven't had a thing. Wow. I mean, and I'm wondering when I'm going to break down. Because eventually I, I feel like I'm going to break down. But mm -hmm. I have not had a piece of refined sugar. I've had fruit. That's, that's impressive. Fruit. Yeah. But I, and, I, and I just ask people that because I wonder how long um, you, can, you can wear that badge of courage, you know, before it, <laughs> right, before it comes it's in. Like, oh, yeah. that's gonna so good. Last, last but not least, Keith, you, you, you have a clean bill of health. You still go get checked. You have no other issues right now. Dude, as far as you're concerned, you got this thing whipped. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel great. Well, dude, I am proud to have known you. I'm proud to have met you. Uh, next time you want to go inline skating, don't call me, <laughs> but uh, let me know, and I'll take some uh, some pictures. All right. <laughs> I absolutely. can maybe go a couple football fields, but that's as far as that's I can go. That's about it. You're in great shape for your age, my friend. Well, Thank you very much. You. Thank Appreciate you, you sharing your story. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. That's one of them. Good job, man. That was great.